Hello and welcome to this mental health awareness recorded webinar. We'll get straight into the content for you. So by the end of this session, you will be able to identify why mental health is important, identify common sources of stress, spot the basic signs of mental ill health, start a conversation with someone and top tips for us on keeping mentally well. So a brief introduction about myself. My name is Sally Desborough. I am a mental health first aid training instructor, so I'm accredited by Mental Health First Aid England to deliver training, but I also develop my own workshops and webinars such as these. Now, my background's actually in HR, so I started working in HR in 2008. And over the course of my career, I saw the number of mental health issues in the workplace increasing, and more and more so, I was having conversations with people experiencing difficulty. That combined with my own experience of mental illness back in 2016 really drove me to wanting to do more to talk about mental health and mental illness and advocate for, for mental health a little bit more. Um, and not only that, but help people to feel empowered with their knowledge and their skill set and that confidence to be able to support others who might be experiencing difficulty. So in 2017, um, I took the opportunity to become a mental health first aid instructor. So I'm accredited by them and by extension, the Royal Society for Public Health to deliver mental health first aid courses, but also, like I say, delivering my own bespoke courses. So my background is in HR. I'm not a counsellor or therapist or psychologist. And for me, it's all about mental health awareness, raising these issues in our communities so we can better understand and better support one another. So first of all, we're going to look at the prevalence of mental health issues, just for a bit of background. OK, so we know that one in four people in the UK experience mental health issues each year. Um, that was before this current pandemic. So in all truth and honesty, I expect we will start to see those figures increase. Uh, but currently, uh, the statistics are telling us one in four people in the UK experience mental health issues each year. And in England, one in six workers have symptoms associated with mental ill health. So most commonly, we're looking at anxiety, depression and stress related issues when we're looking at these figures. Moving on then, 75% of mental illness starts before the age of 18. Again, this is what research is telling us. And then poor mental health impacts on individuals and their families in lost income lower educational attainment, quality of life, and a shorter lifespan. Okay, so if mental illness is starting in adolescence and we aren't identifying this, we're not capturing it, it can have long-term impacts and consequences. So poor mental health can cause difficulties with focus, concentration, and studies. So that might then result in lower grades being achieved by somebody at school. And um, that then might impact further education it might impact their employment later on. So depending on the grades, the qualifications they have, it might impact their employment later on. Um, and with that, we see with poor mental health, people becoming more socially isolated. They find it difficult to develop those relationships. So again, you might see that go on through someone's lifetime. So 75% of mental illness is starting before the age of 18. And we aren't identifying that. We're not getting the right support and help then you can see how it might impact the individual themselves and their families in lost income, in that lower educational attainment, that quality of life and shorter lifespan. Now, when it comes to shorter lifespan, it's not necessarily because people are taking their own lives. Sadly, that, that can be an outcome of mental illness. But actually, it's more about generally being able to look after their well-being physically. So we can see physical health issues that go alongside mental health issues as well. Moving on then, 72 million working days are lost every year through mental ill health and it's costing organisations something like up to £45 billion. Pounds. Okay, so that is a mix of sickness absence as a result of mental ill health as well as presenteeism. So some research is telling us that presenteeism is twice as costly to organisations than absenteeism. And um, not only that, but staff turnover. This is a cost to organisations where people are leaving work because of mental health issues. In 2018, there were 6,154 suicides. That's more than 16 every day. Just pausing for a moment there. 
okay, in that same year, there were 1,784 deaths caused by road traffic accidents. So just as a comparison there, we can see that suicides are three and a half times, four times higher than deaths caused by road traffic accidents. One in five people experience suicidal thoughts at some time. So you're more likely to come across someone who's had suicidal thoughts than a heart attack. So if you manage a team of 15 people, it is quite likely that three people in that team will have experienced some kind of suicidal thoughts at some time. So why is talking about mental health important? It's important talking about it all the time, but currently in, in this pandemic, there is a lot of discussion about um, mental health. And why is it important to talk about? Well, it's because we all have it, okay? We all have mental health just like we all have physical health. We all have emotions, we all have thoughts, we all deal with different life events, um, we react to different situations, we have relationships that might become strained, um, we also have really positive relationships. But mental health is something that we all have and I think sometimes it's considered quite a negative thing. Um, there are negative connotations associated with it. But we all have it like we all have physical health. Okay, so we can think of it in those terms and the quality of our mental health is shown by all sorts of different things so how we feel think and behave so if we think quite positively and have self-confidence then we'll feel quite positive and confident um, and then we might behave more positively than if someone thinks really negatively about themselves then they would feel negatively about themselves and then that might impact their behavior they might have that low self-esteem and confidence I think resilience all has a part to play in this. So how we bounce back from the setback. So if something doesn't go quite right, do we take the, the good from the situation, learn from it and move on? Or do we find it really difficult to, to kind of get up and move on? It's also about how we feel about ourselves and our future, you know, where our self-esteem and confidence is at and how we are able to focus and concentrate, hold relationships, how we can learn. Okay, so... Those are all the things that kind of indicate our mental health state. So it's completely fluid and changeable. If we get a bad night's sleep, we might feel a bit irritable. We might not be able to focus and concentrate. We might find it a bit more difficult to make important decisions, but actually we're able to recover that because we can get to good sleep later on. And mental health isn't the opposite of mental illness. So people who experience um, a diagnosed mental illness like bipolar disorder, they can have positive mental health. Okay, so it's the overall picture. It's not just about diagnosis, but it's how we see ourselves. It's how we see our future. It's how we feel about ourselves. So then what influences our mental health? Now, this list is by no means exhaustive, okay, but just visiting a few. So alcohol use, that can impact our mental health. Sleep, we know that sleep is really important for our mental health. So if we're not getting good sleep, that can impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, our finances, experiencing trauma, relationships. So all these different things can impact our mental health. And a lot of these things can happen to a lot of people. Any of these things, getting poor sleep, having a lack of support, smoking, relationship difficulties, divorce, experience stigma or discrimination, suffering a bereavement, caring for someone. Any of these things can happen to anyone at any time. And they can cause an element of stress. Yeah, so stress is the main thing that I'm going to cover in this next section. Um, so if we look at our stress container model then, this model explains why some people might experience a mental health issue and others not. Okay, so there is a strong relationship in this model between vulnerability and stress. So you might have two people who are in really pressurised jobs, say a managing director of a large corporate organisation, and one person completely thrives under that pressure, all that responsibility that they have might completely thrive in that. And then you might have somebody else in the same or similar position who really struggles with that high-pressured environment. Um, and that might be down to their level of vulnerability. Now, vulnerability can come from a whole range of different factors. It could be a genetic predisposition. It could have been experiencing some kind of trauma previously. Okay, so it could be some kind of bullying or, or neglect. Okay, so within the stress container model, 
our stress flows into the container. Okay, so that might be workload pressures, it might be concerns about health, um, it could be stresses about issues with the boiler at home. So stress is really an overarching term that we can use for all sorts of different things from getting stuck, stuck in a traffic jam through to experiencing a bereavement. Okay, so we've got these different levels of stress. And our stress flows into the container. So imagine a bucket and imagine the stress as water. So the stress flows into that bucket. On our bucket, we have a tap, okay? So the tap represents our coping strategies. So we might have some helpful coping strategies that open the tap and let the stress out. So if you imagine a bucket now with a tap on it, and we're, we're using our helpful coping strategies that opens the tap and releases the water, it lets the stress out. We might also have unhelpful coping strategies. So where the tap blocks and the container fills, and overflows. So thinking about helpful coping mechanisms, moderate exercise, talking, fantastic for um, stress relief, getting good sleep, eating well, reducing our caffeine intake, breathing relaxation techniques, reading and yoga. And then some unhelpful mechanisms, smoking, drinking too much alcohol, using illicit drugs, isolating self from others, ignoring the issue, dwelling on the negative, eating too much fast food. Being completely honest, some of us might use unhelpful coping strategies from time to time, but actually if that unhelpful coping strategy becomes more of a habit, that's when it can become a problem. So if we aren't managing our stress, so if that water is filling the bucket, it might actually come to a point where that bucket overflows, the container overflows, and that's when problems can develop. So you might see some emotional snapping with people becoming irritable, people becoming angry, and potentially you might see the eventual onset of a mental health issue. So if we aren't dealing with our stress, perhaps we are using unhelpful coping strategies that's causing the tap to block, then we might see that container start to overflow. So if we aren't dealing with stress, then that can lead to negative outcomes. But we can remember that some stress is good for us. So deadlines help us to get the work done. If we don't have deadlines, does the work get done? So some stress is good for us, but too much for too long can lead to those problems. But what is too much varies from person to person and it depends on the size of their container. So someone might have a bucket sized container, someone might have an egg cup sized container because of their level of vulnerability. So potentially a genetic predisposition, potentially having experienced some kind of bullying or something like that. But I say that with the caveat that when people experience difficulty, they might build huge amounts of resilience. So then how does stress affect us? So some pictures here to demonstrate how stress might affect us. So on the very left represents physical. Physically, stress can affect us. We can get headaches, we can get stomach aches, we can get tension in our neck and shoulders. Emotionally, we might start to feel angry or sad. We might feel more emotional, overwhelmed. Behaviorally, you might start to see more irritability. You might see aggression or you might see someone withdrawing. And then our thoughts as well. So we might think that we can't cope. We might start to think negatively about what is going on. So stress can affect us in all these different ways, physically, emotionally, behaviorally, and cognitively as well. And really the things that we're going to notice are the physical and the behavioral. So if someone is stressed, if someone's experiencing difficulty, it's going to be those physical and behavioral signs and symptoms. If someone's experiencing stress for a long time, you might start to see them a little bit more disheveled. They might not be able to look after themselves as much. Behaviorally, you might start to see that um, social isolation. We don't really see people's emotions unless it's expressed through behavior. So crying, a sad face, angry outbursts, or being quieter. And likely we won't see people's thoughts either. We can't see in people's minds. So those are the things we might spot at work, those physical and behavioral changes, but also in our day-to-day -day lives as well. So what's really important to know is what people's normal is. To spot these changes, we need to know what their normal is. If someone is usually outgoing and chatty, that's their normal. You know, on a Monday weekend talk, 
how was your weekend? This is what I got up to. What did you get up to? If actually over a few days, a few weeks, you start to notice a change, their tone of voice might change from their kind of uplifting voice to a more monotone or low voice, um, then actually you might want to think about having a conversation. Likewise, someone else's normal might be of a quieter disposition. However, a change could be showing more frustrated outbursts. So again, we need to look up, we need to be present, we need to notice. Given that we're physically distant from people now, you know, we're going to be even more, need to be even more mindful of that over our video conference calls. What are people's facial expressions telling you? What is their tone of voice saying to you? So we need to be thinking about what might be going on to somebody you know normal what is normal it's that person's normal i think there's something like over seven million different types of normal in this world um but it's what what the norm is for that specific individual so the people in your team so it's really important to know our people so how do we have a conversation if we do notice something i think when it comes to stress and mental health issues actually we aren't really educated we're not really told how to respond we might be worried that we might say the wrong thing. So I just want to share some top tips with you on what we can say, because there is that nervousness. Um, so some top tips for you um, about having a conversation. Um, and some of this touches on if you're in person, but actually, you know, this applies just as easily if you're having a conversation over video conference or over the phone. So choosing a safe setting to chat, obviously in person, that could be going for a walk on talk, that could be having a chat over a coffee or some lunch um, or booking a meeting room. In this day and age, you know, we're, we're having kind of conversations over VC, so that's probably um, more safe in a one-to-one -one, uh, setting. Have a conversation about feelings. Okay, so any conversation about stress or any conversation about mental health issues is about feelings. Okay, so on the right hand side there we have this bubble. Um, how are you feeling at the moment? How long have you felt like this? Who do you feel you can go to for support? Have you spoken to anyone else? And is there anything I or we can do to help? And it's really common for us to say, hi, how are you? It's part of our greeting now and some might say, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Ask again, ask, okay, yeah. That's, that's great. How are you coping with everything? How's work going? How are you feeling about things at the moment? It's quite a change. We want to create that safe environment for people to be able to talk about how they're feeling. So we can also say, I don't know about you, but I've actually had a bit of a struggle the last couple of days. I found it a bit difficult. So if as a manager you are concerned about someone, you can relate to them by ex talking about your own experiences as well. So listen to what and how they're saying it, listen to how they're responding, what they're saying. They might very well say, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, I'm really good. So what I'm saying is, yeah, I'm fine, thanks, I'm really good. But how I'm saying it, it's not in congruence with that. So watch out for both of those things, the words and the language, but also that tone of voice and how they're saying it. Give time and space for responses. So if actually they do share that they are struggling at the moment, so you can just say, okay, I'm, I'm here for you. Tell me a bit more. Um, really important that we give that time and space. A lot of people struggle with those silences, awkward silences, but silences can actually be really, really supportive when someone's trying to gather their thoughts and working out how they're going to verbalise what they're experiencing. You can also reflect back changes in behaviour. So you can say, um, I am concerned about you. I've, I've noticed that in the last couple of days, your, your tone of voice has changed a lot and, and that worries me because normally you're quite bright. Um, your voice is usually, you know, up and down in tone. And I've just noticed the last couple of days that that's changed. So I'm a bit worried about you and I just wanted to explore that with you a bit more. You're not your usual smiley, smiley self. If you're on video conference, you can refer to that as well. Keeping our body language open, confident and neutral. Being mindful of what our face is saying. So we, if we are having those conversations over VC, being mindful of keeping that neutral face if they do share something with you, not frowning or showing any shock, but just being neutral with them. Being empathic and genuine, no judgments. Everyone experiences life in different ways. Everyone experiences stress in different ways. We don't necessarily know what people's vulnerability is 
in the background. So we should absolutely make no judgments for what's going on for somebody. Um, and we don't give advice either. So we can empathise, talk about our experiences, but we wouldn't necessarily advise them and say, well, you know what you should do? You should do this. Because that can be really unhelpful for a lot of people. Sometimes it's just having that ear and having that non-judgmental conversation to get things off their chest. And that's what's really important about this. So your top tips really are about creating that safe setting, having a conversation about those feelings, asking if they're speaking to anyone, what does their support look like, if there's anything that you can do to help them, and just keeping in touch with them on a regular basis to see how they're getting on. And then lastly, thinking about some top tips on keeping mentally well. Um, so this is for people whether they're working or not, okay? Um, but my first top tip is around keeping a routine. So it can be really simple, you know, getting up and going to bed at the same time every day, making sure we're getting dressed every day. Uh, for some people working from home, they might put on work attire, um, but it's really important to mark the difference between sleep time and daytime. Fantastic to start the day with some exercise as well or some stretching. So being physically active in the morning sets us up for the day, helps us to feel good, wakes up our body and mind start the day positively and it can change our mood as well. Eating regular meals at regular times, structuring our day is really effective for those working from home um, and actually blocking time, so blocking two hours to focus on this, blocking two hours to focus on this, building in one hour for lunch time as well. So it really helps to build that self-discipline and organisation. Um, it eliminates distractions and it can actually help with perfectionism as well. So if you know, you're spending one hour on that task, it's one hour only, and you leave it and then move on. You know, having that routine, like I've said, building those breaks, build, building that lunch time, it helps us to achieve a balance, um, because it can be tempting to kind of just stay at your computer all day, every day, um, but we do need to prioritise our self-care. And part of our routine is having a bed routine as well. So it really helps us to, to get to sleep easier if we have an evening routine. So having those um, relaxing routines in the e evening, like having a warm bath, reading a book, doing some meditation, um, even getting clothes out for the next day, prepping lunch for the next day. So actually you're minimising stress that might happen as well. And remembering that we should be turning our screens off at least one hour before we go to bed. We can plan our work for the next day as well. So set out what we want to achieve the next day so that we still get that sense of achievement as well. So then communication and staying social. There are so many opportunities using technology to stay in touch with one another. This term social distancing, I don't really like it to be perfectly honest because we want to stay social. Uh, what I will say is it's more physical distancing. But there are many ways we can stay in touch through Facebook, Skype, FaceTime, WhatsApp zoom meetings we have um, microsoft teams so all these great ways to stay in touch you know we have email but actually we might want to pick up the phone or have a video conference instead we know that conversations and talking about what's going on for us is a great way to relieve stress we do need human contact but in a workplace setting as well we do need to Think about that safe space to talk about feelings. You know, how are you? Asking that question twice. How are you finding things at the moment? How are you finding the balance of working at home um, and homeschooling the children and getting your rest breaks? Are we setting goals and expectations with our teams? Are we being really explicit on what the expectations are? Are we having those regular one-to-ones with people? Are we having those regular team meetings? I know some organisations are having a, a nine o'clock to half nine team meeting just to keep in touch not necessarily about work but doing a check-in doing a temperature check on how people are feeling and actually sharing what's going on for ourselves as well and it might be that you choose to do an end of day achievements communication over some kind of messaging or on microsoft teams as a way of interacting and say you know this is what i've achieved today and these are my plans for tomorrow and sharing that success with one another i think it's easy to forget the successes 
but we also need to balance in the office we are able to get up from our desks and go to photocopiers and printers and things like that and have a chat at desks actually people are spending more time in front of screens now more than ever so remembering you know five minutes away from your screen to rest those eyes we need to be thinking about our bodies as well you know building in time for stretching building in time for that exercise and those rests and um, people are feeling exhausted by the amount of time they're spending on video conferencing so we need to acknowledge that and talk to our teams about what suits them because everyone has different needs and i think we also need to acknowledge that people will have different routines yes the expectations are that we need people to work and do their jobs but some people will have different routines depending if they have children or not if they're homeschooling actually you know I know someone who's getting up at 4 a.m and working till 7 a.m and achieving a fantastic amount of work for, for those three hours then from 7 till 12 with the children and then the afternoon carrying on working um, from 2 until 6 and um, so they're doing seven hours but actually looks very different to your usual kind of nine to five really important to note as well that we are seeing an increase in musculoskeletal problems so as part of the routine encouraging people to get up and do those stretches if people are sitting well if they have a good posture if their setup is like an office then it's recommended moving 25 minutes if however it's not so great you know people are having to find creative ways of creating a, a space um, then we should be encouraging people to move every 15 minutes to avoid those um, those issues so this routine this communication is all coming um, they're all interrelated and this also leads on to the flexibility around people's different routines um, so like i've said we do have expectations of people in terms of what we expect them to achieve and what work they're doing but we do need to give that flexibility in terms of different routines for different people people have different needs different communication styles so we do need to be mindful of that all the time also have a section here about resources so we know there's a lot of free information out there at the moment it can be overwhelming there's information on LinkedIn there's information on Facebook um, there's information from the World Health Organization information from the NHS so what are what are you telling your staff to look at where can they look you know, it's a really great idea to have a section maybe on um, Microsoft Teams or if you have an intranet site or if you have some shared drives of where people can go to for information for support that is available. So are you recommending people to look at Mind, for example? Do you have an employee assistance program? Do you have information about how to set up an effective office environment for the home? What about free training resources for the home workers? So there is so much information out there. Are employees having to look for that themselves or are you finding a one-stop shop for them to go to to find that information? And then last but not least, the exercise piece. So exercise, really, really important for our mental health not just our mental health, but our physical health as well. There is so much science, detailed science, about the benefits and reasons why we might want to consider making exercise a daily habit. Exercise reduces stress, it reduces feelings of loneliness and isolation, it can put you in touch with others, even just a passing by hello, for, particularly for those who are at home on their own reduces symptoms of mental health conditions like depression so there is research that tells us that exercise can be just as effective as an antidepressants in treating mild to moderate depression it improves mood it helps with the recovery from mental health issues it improves our sleep it helps us to think more clearly helps to improve memory it protects the brain against injury and disease also practicing mindfulness while doing exercise reduces stress and improves mental health even further. It can improve our self-esteem and self-worth as well. So there are so many benefits, um, both physically and mentally, to doing exercise. So those are my top tips for you. So I hope you found this mental health awareness webinar helpful. We have covered the prevalence of mental health issues. We have covered stress, common sources of stress as well as our stress container model we've looked at some top tips on how to have conversations with someone who might be experiencing some difficulty and i've finished here on some top tips 
for keeping mentally well. Take good care of yourselves. Thank you.